Hello and a warm welcome. I am Armin Trost, Professor for Organizational Behavior at the Furtwangen University in Germany and this is my course on Social Research Methods. So, hello everybody. This is the third, maybe the second episode regarding statistics. Last time we were talking about descriptive statistics. This time we're going to talk about bivariate statistics. What is bivariate statistics? That's already an essential term. Bivariate, as this bi already indicates, is about the relation between two vari variables. Okay? I mean, in this series we already had a lot of examples um, where we looked at the relation between two variables. Right? So, um, let me guide through different methods that you can use. Uh, simple methods and uh, one of course is the correlation. Right? And uh, I know that in the previous episodes I already were talking about the correlation and when we were talking about testing, for instance, we were talking about correlation a lot. And also when we were talking about validity, reliability and object objectivity, I had to refer to the correlation. So all those of you who already have watched the previous episodes, you, you should be familiar with the correlation. For those who are only wanted to watch only this episode, I would like to explain correlation real quick. So what is correlation? When we talk about correlation, the correlation, we talk about the Pearson correlation. There are various types of correlation in statistics, right? But in practice, when we refer to the correlation, we pretty much mean a statistical concept that describes the linear relation between two variables two variables x and y. So if you have two variables x and y, uh, the correlation between the two could be between minus one and plus one. Plus one would mean that there is a perfect positive linear relation between two variables. The higher the one, the higher the others. Absolutely perfect linear one, okay? Zero would mean there is no relation at all. No, nothing. One variable has nothing to do with the other, right? So when you now have a correlation of, let's say, 0.5, that would mean that, oh, yeah, there is something, there is a positive relation, but it's not perfect, there is something, 0.5, right? Um, based on one variable, you can predict 50% of the other variable. That's the idea of 0.5. If you, when you know one variable, you already know the half of the other, right? What is the other half? We don't know. We don't know. Right? So, if you have a correlation of, let's say, minus 0.5, it's exactly the opposite. Just doesn't. It's a negative. Yeah. The higher x, the lower, not higher, the lower y, right? So. Yeah, you can imagine this. Um, and um, with correlation, please keep in mind, it's, um, it's linear relation, okay? Sometimes relations between two variables are curvy, linear, or, or whatever, exponential. Uh, with the classic correlation, we always think about the linear correlation, okay? So when you have two variables, which are at least on an interval scale or ratio scale, you can calculate a correlation. That's uh, something that we very often do. What is the correlation between job satisfaction and performance? Something like this, right? What is the correlation between job satisfaction and consumer satisfaction? Hmm. What is the correlation between intelligence and performance? What is the correlation between intelligence and salary <laughs> in, in a specific age? Yeah. Um, you can create all sorts of things, okay? Um, when we think of this kind of correlation, we very often use, 
scatter plots to, to illustrate the relation between two variables. A scatter plot is nothing else than having the two variables, the independent variable and the dependent variable, or let's say just the two variables. And then, I mean, for every variable, uh, for every subject in our study, we have two values, yeah? one for the independent and one for the dependent. And then when you have these two axes, you can, you can assign, allocate every subject into this kind of two-dimensional graph. And when you do this, let's say for 100 subjects, you get 100 dots. And these 100 dots, they make up what we name a scatter plot. A scatter plot is a, it's a cool way to illustrate the entire relation distribution of, of two variables. That, that's pretty nice. A much simpler way of, of uh, looking at the relation between two variables is using what we name contingency table. Uh, contingency tables are um, just about the frequencies that you show. You can use contingency tables for nearly all data, uh, even for interval data, for for uh, data on interval, uh, for data on ordinal level or nominal level, uh, you can do so. Uh, I have here a very simple example. I show you some examples now from studies that we have done as part of my social research method class. Uh, we, we used to, uh, my students are encouraged to run little studies, very little studies, very often in the field, uh, very rarely in the laboratory, but in the field. So they probably look at two variables and they look, okay, is there a relation? And that's pretty funny. And, and there were two students who, 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 who took up the idea that women take longer to, uh, for parking a car, which uh, actually turned out not to be true. <laughs> uh, so independent variable was gender, male, female, and the dependent variable was parking speed. Okay, so you might have a very simple table, right? Um, building clusters up to 13 seconds or 13 to 20 seconds, more than 20 seconds, and you see, okay, women, men, what are the frequencies in these different categories? It's a very simple way of, of, of looking at the relation between two variables. Uh, I mean, these kinds of uh, analysis you also find in newspapers. It's, it's very simple. And when you want to illustrate something like this, you also can have something like a stacked bar chart, stacked bar chart. You simply have uh, two, two bars that add up to 100%, and then you have these different segments. And, and in this picture here, you see the exact same information as in the contingency table, just in a, in a, in a more in a, in a graphic, in a graphic uh, manner. It's also, also pretty nice. You can also combine this and now add these numbers into these different bars. Also, also, also a nice idea. A more advanced idea is something like um, a box, uh, box whisker diagram. Um, and here is a, a comparison of, of different groups. So, okay, uh, box whisker is very nice, I think, uh, because with box whisker uh, diagrams, you 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 not only see the the average. It's not only that you make a, an, an uh, or the, see the different median or so. You also see the dispersion around uh, the median or, or the average. So you have the upper quartile, you have the lower quartile, so the first quartile, you have the most extreme value, uh, the most extreme upper value, and the most extreme lower value. And you not only see the comparison between different groups, but also how the values um, are distributed around the central tendencies. So it's, it's pretty nice. I, I like the box visco uh, diagrams. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a cool way. So uh, let's be more, more precise now. And um, I would like to share with you, uh, again, two other little studies uh, which we have done as part of my, my social research method uh, course, which I do here at the University of uh, Fort Wangen. And just to show you how, how you can simply uh, analyze uh, the relationship between two variables. And here uh, we really talk about a little quasi experiment. And um, in this case, um, students uh, investigated uh, the effect of alcohol consumption on, on the reaction time. Uh, you can uh, measure reaction time by uh, the, with the falling stick technique. Yeah. Uh, I don't have one here now in the moment. Uh, you simply have a stick, a linear or a pen. Yeah. So, so the one has to put the uh, to put the fingers around the pen, not touching it, yeah, so that it can fall. And then another person let it fall. Pop, yeah, and when it falls, the other person has to grasp it. 
yeah, as, as fast as possible yeah, when, it, when, it, when it falls. So, and now when the stick is here and you let it fall, it falls down and you fast, you grab it really fast and then this short distance is the exact measurement of your reaction time. It's pretty cool, right? You do it with the stick. You can imagine this, okay? Simple. So, so reactivity was measured in four cycles. So in the beginning, then they drank a beer, and then again, drank a beer, measured again, drank a beer, measured again. And you see, the reaction time goes up. Hmm. It was not surprised so much. Oh, okay. So here is another study. Uh, we created a self-administered questionnaire that was supposed to measure uh, fashion awareness. That's how we, we, we named it, fashion awareness. Uh, we only asked uh, male students, by the way, um, in there, we just asked some questions what about do's and don'ts uh, regarding fashion. Uh, so, is it allowed to wear a tie with a short sleeve sh uh, shirt? No, it's not. Don't do it. Uh, when you have, when you wear brown shoes uh, with the suit, um, uh, what's the color of your belt? It's the same. Yeah? If you have brown shoes, brown belt, black shoes, black belt. When you have, ah, what did we ask when you, when you, when you wear a button shirt, button down shirt, like this is a button down shirt, yes, this button here, you know, see here. Is it allowed to wear a tie with a button down shirt? Is it allowed? No, it's not. White socks, is it allowed? Only when you play tennis. Is it allowed to wear brown shoes after six? No. Um, <laughs> some, um, some rules, you know, some rules. Um, what means business casual? Yeah. So we ask all these things and some students got everything right, some just a few. So, so we calculate an overall index of fashion awareness and we compared the fashion awareness index uh, among different study programs. There were engineers, uh, business students, uh, computer scientists, and, and uh, social scientists. Um, and we found out that the business students had the highest level of fashion awareness and the computer scientists, the least, they simply did not care. <laughs> okay, so you see this different analysis, which I just have shown you. One was with a line and one was with a crab, with, with the bars. Right. So in this case now here, could we also have drawn a line? That's the question. A line? Yeah. Engineering business. A line? Answer is no. Why not? Because we cannot interpret the space between the bars. Right. With the others, with the alcohol consumption, a line was okay. Could we also have shown a bar? Yes, of course. Why could we have shown a bar and line in the other example, but not in this one with the fashion awareness? Simple answer. Because in this particular case here, that you see here, the independent variable is on what level? What kind of data do we have here? Is that nominal, ordinal, interval ratio? It's nominal, right? So here it is again. So when the independent variable is nominal, you do not draw a line. Yeah. In this case, with fashion awareness, you could also change the order of the different study programs. Would would be absolutely okay. But with the alcohol consumption, there was really an order from no alcohol up to much alcohol. There was really an order. It's not nominal scale. It was at least ordinal scale. I would say rather interval scale because the, the amount of alcohol that was consumed was absolutely constant between every interval. Okay. So you see, here is it again. It's absolutely important. When you think about the analysis of the relation, you have to understand on which level is your data. Nominal, ordinal, interval ratio. And if you, if you don't know what the difference is, go back to my episode, which I have produced earlier about these different types of data. So I prepared for you um, a an, an kind of overview which, which really helps you when you in your thesis or in your little study when you when you analyze the relation between two variables the question really is 
uh, on which level is your independent variable and on which level is your dependent variable yeah in terms of nominal ordinal interval or ratio and i added one thing here uh, dichotomous dichotomous are variables which just have two two um, options sometimes something like yes or no pregnant non-pregnant in a very ideal world let's say a simple world uh, uh, children picture book world uh, we have male female I know there's many more others but male female dichotomous uh, so very often you have just two 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 uh, categories dichotomous okay so you have to be aware of, of what you what you have and based on what you have you can do different analysis of course you can do something like contingency tables all the time yeah but but when you when you independent variable yeah? when your dependent variable sorry when your dependent variable is uh, interval or ratio you could do something like uh, uh, a mean comparison yeah so you have your you have your independent variable right whatever that is and then based on the independent variable you can calculate averages of your dependent variable and compare it just like we did it with your with our fashion awareness thing right uh, correlation you can only do when both the independent variable and the dependent variable are at least on interval uh, 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 inter uh, interval data interval or ratio also when it's dichotomous when, when something is dichotomous you can do everything <laughs> so, yeah interesting enough yeah. so that's that's very important to see this and um, I added two more concepts here uh, it's the median split and the clustering um, sometimes the, in, the independent variable is a continuous variable. Let's say the, the, you do an analysis about the relationship between um, uh, salary and intelligence. You say, okay, let's look at uh, people who are in the age of 40, let's say. Okay? So we have people in the age of 40 and we look at their intelligence. Okay? We measure their intelligence and then we ask them, okay, how much do you earn? And as you know, uh, intelligence can rank from, pff, the, the average is 100, but it can rank from, I don't know, 60, which is <laughs> very low, 160, which is uh, genius. Uh, uh, so you have this range. So, and I mean, what you can do now is really, you, you, you I mean, it's a continuum, right? It's a continuum and you have people in, all different values so so what you can do is you you can just take the group and split it into two halves saying okay now let's have all those with uh, let's say intelligence below 100 and all those with more than 100 so the, you split the group into two and let's say the medium is 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 is, is uh, equal to the mean which is with intelligence which is probably the case you just compare two groups those below 100 and those above 100. It's a median split. You split with a median. Yeah? And now you look, at, um, you look at the average with regards to the dependent variable, which is the salary. You compare the salary of those below 100 with the salary of those above 100. This is a median split. Sometimes that's reasonable. Um, a more advanced version would be the quartile split. So you, you split the group into four equal groups and then you look at the, the average of the dependent variable. That's also something that you could do. Uh, clustering is a kind of split. You, you, just, you just cluster groups yeah, into certain categories. So, so um, let's say your independent variable is uh, a nominal scale. Yeah? You have the independent variable is from which com country are you, in which country were you born, and you have 50 countries in your, in your group. You might cluster these countries uh, on which basis you ever do this. So you do not compare all the, what did I say, 40, 50 countries. Yeah, you, you make groups maybe. So maybe that could make sense, right? So, okay, so uh, that, that, that really could help. And uh, the funny thing is that 
I've shown you this correlation, I've shown you this uh, comparison of mean, I've shown you a contingency table. Very often that's the result of your study, right? So sometimes you work weeks on a study and the outcome is just simply this little graph. Yeah. And I know that students very often have the tendency to, to analyze like hell. They squeeze out whatever it's in the data. No, you don't. Yeah, you don't. Sometimes it's just two numbers, hmm? two averages that you compare. Control group, experimental group, that's it. Hmm? So hmm? it's very often not so much. It's, it's just a little. Okay, so uh, what I should add here now is um, what you typically do is, but I would, don't want to do this now, is that when you look at the relationship between two variables, right, and you find differences in mean, for instance, between, let's say, an experimental group and a control group, or whatever. The first thing you do when you see this is you, you, you celebrate, say, yeah, there's a difference. <laughs> and, and maybe it supports your hypothesis. Okay, congratulations. But now comes a critical question. And the question is, this difference that you found, this effect that you found, is that could it be that this effect is just random? Could this be? Maybe this is a random effect. Um, if this question comes up, the question of course is, how big is the probability that this effect that you found can happen on a random basis? How, why is the probability? The probability is always given, right? But what you want is that the probability is low, right? Um, so you have to do a test. I don't want to explain it here right, because that goes uh, much further, but you should know that this exists. Yeah? And for every scientific paper, you have to do this test now. You have to uh, calculate to what extent the effect you found could have occurred just randomly. And if, the, if you calculate, if you do an F-test or a T-test, uh, if, you, if you test uh, uh, this, this uh, probability of error, uh, if the probability of error is lower than 5%, then we name it significant. If it's lower than 1%, we name it very significant. So this is something you always add, always. Yeah. Um, the test statistics. F test, T test. As I said, I don't want to go deep into this, but it would it was worth to to mention it at this point. Okay, so let's leave it to this. It was rather short episode. Thanks for listening and watching, and see you next time.